Welcome to the Dawi Roundtable podcast. I am Robert Coons. Today on the Roundtable, I am delighted to be able to chat with my good friends at the Kung Fu Conversation podcast, Randall Davis and Owen Schilling. Kung Fu Conversations is a podcast which interviews various well-known and some not so well-known figures in the world of kung fu and beyond not only limited to northern chinese martial arts such as xin yichuan taiji bagua baji pigua etc but also including southern styles uh, including things like white crane kung fu hunga and uh, various other styles owen and randall have a long background both in styles like wing chun as well as in uh, bagua so It was really interesting chatting with them, and both of them have a very long history in the martial arts, having lots and lots of experience and being teachers in their own right. Again, I was just absolutely delighted to be able to have them on our podcast, and in a sense, we're getting kind of meta here, because our podcast at Dawi is interviewing another podcast, so we really like this kind of stuff, because Dawi isn't just about interviewing practitioners and teachers. We also like to talk to people that also exist in the uh, internal arts, uh, internal cultivation media, since um, those figures uh, contribute greatly to the broader community. And so in order for us to understand what's going on in the broader world of internal cultivation, then uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to talk to people like uh like Randall and Owen. So I hope that you'll enjoy this episode. Uh, I really had a fun time interviewing them. Uh, They were just delightful to have on the show. And so uh, without any further ado, I present to you uh, this roundtable talk with Kung Fu Conversations podcast. Hello, gentlemen. Good Good morning, morning, sir. I didn't have to do the intro, Owen. That was nice. (laughs) Hey. So Kung Fu Conversations, if you haven't heard it, yeah, I don't know where you've been living, but um, for, you know, it's is a really cool uh, podcast about martial arts with a focus mainly on Chinese martial arts. And uh, these two gentlemen are the hosts. How long have you been doing the podcast, guys? September will be three years, but we were in the planning stages a few months before that. So, yeah, we're we're coming up to three years, I think it is. Yep. That, that, wow. If my ma- my math does right, yeah. Can't How did this all come about? COVID. Yeah, that was COVID. that was yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the baton and I'll pass it on to you when you're ready, Owen. So, Go for it. You know, COVID changed so many things in so many people's lives, and we have friends that do multiple styles of martial arts. Um, I've got buddies that do nothing but, you know, Western wrestling, uh, professional Western boxers, MMA, and all these other things. And they hit a brick wall with their training because they hadn't, they had, didn't have a practice where you, you could only do a few things, especially our BJJ friends, you know, they really hit a wall. And so we found that we even had to retool some of our training, um, to either work with others, you know, whether it be the mask or, you know, a lot of it went to weapons training where you, you know, you have a six and a half foot staff in your hand and the other person has a six and a half foot staff and you have a good solid distance between you. And so we started to notice, it's like, well, you know, we've got something here where we can still train. And, you know, we noticed maybe that was worth talking about. The other thing too, was I've been working with Owen for almost 12 years now. And we'd go to lunch and talk about how we train, the walls that we run into with being a teacher, uh, the walls we run into with a student, somebody that's really, really good at one thing, but maybe they've hit a plateau or somebody that, you know, needs a little more encouragement. How do you focus on that student without, you know, leaving the other students behind as a focal point? So we also had these fantastic conversations and eventually uh, Owen came to me and he's like, you know, maybe we needed to do a podcast. Everybody seems to be doing that lately. So Owen came up with the idea and here we are rolling into September soon enough with a three year, uh, three year life date, if you will. That's pretty epic. That's pretty cool. So now 
both of you have backgrounds in in Chinese martial arts. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Sure. You want me to start off, Owen? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, in college, I went to Mesa State College in Grand Junction, Colorado, which uh, I hate to say my starting date was 1998 <laughs> to age myself a little bit. Had a blast over there. I did a doctor amount of time in college without a doctorate, if you get my drift. But at the time, the head of the math department, uh, Ed Bonan Hamada, was reaching out to a gentleman who is my current Sifu, who is the sole heir in the United States of the Wong Q lineage of Wing Chun. And it, what's kind of funny too, Robbie, is there's a pretty big uh, gathering or swarth, if you will, of Wong Q practitioners in Canada, of all places. But as far as Wong Q goes in the U.S., it was just my Sifu. So I think I fo focused more on the Kung Fu that I was learning in college than uh, my English degree. And then that following summer, I actually found, I was living in the mountains of Colorado. I actually found a Pac May practitioner here in Longmont where I currently reside. And so I'm like, that's, that's another Southern style. That seems pretty cool. So I was coming over Trail Ridge Pass in the summertime, which is about 240 miles round trip. And then I would study once a week for two summers. That person wound up moving off. I stayed with Wing Chun for many, many, many years. And then over the course of those years, I would cross train with certain people and things like that. In the Pac May field, I became really good friends with that Sifu senior student who's 30 years my elder. My good friend, um, Mr. Burden, Mr. Steve Burden. And Steve and I had kept in touch over the years. I moved to the front range with an old girlfriend. We didn't work out. It was kind of in a dark place. And maybe using the force... Steve reached out to me. Maybe he knew I was down. He's like, hey, I know you're down, um, but you're 50 miles away, but why don't you come train with me? I've got some great people in Boulder. They're doing Shingy. I think you would really like it. I think it would fit you really well. And after four or five visits with Owen, I knew it was a fit. And so I've been working with them since then. And so I do a lot of Owen Shingy. And then I'm maybe two years of, barely dipping my toes into the bagua it's hard as sin but i do love it and so my my main three styles are wing chun shingy and then a dabble into bagua so that's that's kind of my martial arts background how about you owen cool uh yeah um i grew up in a little mountain town uh not too far from where i live now probably about 15 or 20 minutes up the road in the foothills in colorado here and from when I was a little kid, I was always fascinated by martial arts, but I was, I, I lived in a very small town. There was like 800 people there and we were 20 minutes from the next town, which is over here in Longmont, which had a, you know, it was like 10,000 or 12,000 people. So the availability of martial arts was pretty uh, slim. So as a kid, I kind of would do whatever I could get my hands on. So I took a little karate at one time. I took some Taekwondo for six months, um, but it was really uh, a lot about getting badgering my parents into like driving me over once a week or twice a week. Um, and, you know, they just got tired of that. So it, it, it was pretty hit and miss for a long time. And I really didn't start. I did some Aikido like in my, my late teens and uh, I uh, ended up. Uh, at a place called the the Shaolin Center, which is a part of uh, Sun Quante's uh, Shaolin Do School, which is kind of infamous. They've got quite a reputation. Um, but I had a really good time. I started there in 95, and I was there until 99-ish. Uh, so I, I would go back periodically. But in 99, actually it was 98, I found I was this sort of a fortuitous uh, uh story for me i've i found my teacher who is uh from the eat song school under lotus show is lotus show's senior student marcus brinkman he was my he's my primary teacher and uh marcus had i was i was doing my laundry one day and apparently he had put up a flyer in that laundromat and i found that flyer and i i knew what bagua was and i was like hey that looks cool okay because this i mean this is all pre-internet so when I, you know, this is all, there was no, there was, I mean, it was just, there was such a lack of information, A, about Bagua or about most internal martial arts. You know, there was a little bit more about Taiji. Um, 
but Bakuma and Shingi, there really wasn't much out there. Um, I bought, I bought a lot of books and, uh, I had started buying like VHS tapes that had, uh, you know, like, uh, lo- like Lotus show stuff from like 93 and 91. I bought both of those. And then, uh, so eventually I, 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 I went and made a photocopy of that flyer and then I hung it back up cause I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to disrespect him in, in any way. And, uh, I called him. So, uh, and he told me he was a senior student at Lotus Show. And I was like, Hey, uh, is that the guy who's on the videos? And he was like, yes. And I was like, okay, this is, this is good. I like this. I like where it's going. So, yeah. And then I, so I spent the next, uh, s- almost six years as a, uh, private student and, uh, and taking part in his public classes, um, and learning Bagua and learning Shingi, and then occasionally learning some chimpanling Taiji. And that's, and then subsequently I, I, uh, participated, we would bring Lotus show in every year. And then Marcus left, went back to Taiwan in 06. And, uh, we continued to bring Lowell in until I think 2016. And then, uh, and then we brought one of his senior students in for a few years, uh, Matt Autry, which was great. It's a, it was, it was a great thing for me personally, in terms of my learning curve and in terms of the eat song material to really, uh, get some, uh, different perspectives on the material. So I, I got to, you know, obviously study with Marcus and then, uh, put in some time with Lowell, um, you know, more in a seminar format and same with Matt. So just the, the different levels of exposure to the same material, I think really made a difference for me. Yeah, that's exceptional. Wow, both of you guys are really interesting backgrounds. And I, I got to say that Law is a very famous figure in the internal martial arts world, in, especially in the United States. And uh, Marcus as well. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Brinkman, uh, he was uh, he was present from day one of the Internet Bagua phenomenon. Mm-hmm. So, wow, that's so cool. It's, you know, it's really neat for me because sort of from a historical or or um uh anthropological uh sort of viewpoint it's always nice to talk to people who are part of the let's say that i don't know can you call it first generation of bagua in the united states like there's um there's the ezone guys and there's the tst guys that's kind mm-hmm. of like how bagua came to the united states right yep so that's that's fascinating um Okay, so we've we've ascertained that you guys run a podcast. It, it came about during COVID. <laughs> Do full martial arts, both of you, and uh, and you have backstories, of course, which are which are also interesting and awesome. Now, I want to talk more about the podcast, though. Um, mm-hmm. uh, spoiler alert, or I don't know what you, what do what do people say? Transparency. Um, I've been on the podcast, but there are also people who are cool people that have been on the podcast and, and, uh, those, those cool people are, there's quite a few of them, not, not just, uh, not just silly old Rob and his weird stiff left side. Um, so in regard to people that you've had on the podcast, um, who are, who are names that we might know in the internal martial arts community, can you name a few highlights? Oh boy. Um, well, all right. I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to step on this one. Uh, we've had so many, I I think they all bring something very interesting, uh, to the table. Uh, I'll start off with somebody that I thought was really unique and dynamic. And that was Ryan Bloomfield, um, who's up in Canada and he does a family system, the Yong family system, no relation to the Tai Chi of, uh, Shingi Loha. And, I had seen him so much on the internet and, and did I say internet, right? I can't speak English. That's part of being a podcaster is learning the English language. <laughs> uh, I noticed his movement was very different than a lot of the Shingi Luoha I had seen in the past. And I looked, he had a medical, he was a Chinese medical doctor as well. And I'm like, you know what? That's somebody I'd really like to get on the podcast. And so what I really enjoyed about him and it's very similar uh, to what you do, Robbie, is he, his martial arts informs his medical practice and vice versa. And I, I found that the bridge between those two things, you know, was very fascinating. You know, he knew how to, you know, treat his students 
just by watching them move and do their martial arts, you know, by feeling them crossing hands with them or throwing them around or whatever it may be. Um, and saying, Hey, you know what, you need this kind of treatment and I can treat you that way. So I found that to be, uh, really, really interesting. Um, I'll tell you a few of mine and then I'll see where Owen goes. Um, I'm not a Tai Chi guy, but I really loved talking to, uh, Sifu Scott Rodell or Lao Shi Scott Rodell. There was some really interesting stuff that he talked about, um, and his method of Yong style Tai Chi. And one of the things that I really liked that he talks about a lot is it takes hard work. It's, uh, you know, he, he mentions that a lot that, you know, soft is not limp. And uh, what the practices that he would do before a push hands tournament, you know, he'd do a lot of long pole and Tai Chi spear and sword work and having these external implements to strengthen the body and get the tissues ready to be knocked around. So I really enjoyed that one with him. Uh, someone that I think is known worldwide and what's strange is for different things. We could talk Western weightlifting. We could talk martial arts. We could talk Chinese martial arts was Dr. Mark Chain. I really enjoyed talking to Dr. Mark. And it was interesting because I'm not going to pick on the doc. As a matter of fact, I'll let him know about this podcast um, that we had here, but he's been on like 70 or 80 podcasts and I'm probably lowballing that. And so, you know, we ask the foundation questions. And as a podcaster, and as somebody that gets asked a lot to be on a lot of podcasts, I really do think you have what, what I call the rote motor um, skills for your mouth. We're like, okay, this is my background. This is what I do. This is who I've trained with, blah, 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 blah. And we got through that for the first 20 to 30 minutes. But then Owen and I started asking specific questions. And I really enjoyed that one because it was one of our first guests that went, huh, I've never been asked that question before. And so he really enjoyed that. And, you know, we went down a few rabbit holes and he reached out afterwards. He's like, hey, I had a blast there. You know, I, again, he's like, I, I came up with some answers that even surprised me. And I'm like, hey, if you want to use any of that for a book down the road, please do. And so those are three that really stand out uh, as far as, as uh, the internal as besides yourself, Robbie, I got to give you a lot of props. Uh -huh. as, a matter, as a matter of fact, you know, what's funny is I'm going to leave you with this thought and then I'll let Owen take the baton. Um, your episode for Owen's group, the Boulder Internal Arts Group, was mentioned probably the most by everyone at the school, that that, that one really shined. So you answered a lot. Of, I think one of the big things, and you actually talk about it and when you interviewed uh, Master uh, Hayong, was you know that the Taoist schools were schools and not so much like a lineage thing. And 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 the, and that every even on this end, be, being on the recording end, my little brain went, didn't know that. Gonna have to check that out. So yeah, there was a lot of of um, questions answered that I've been asking, you know, in almost you know thir almost thirty years of training martial arts. So really enjoyed that, and thank you. So who are your who are your top guests, Owen? That's tough. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it. I, I don't have any children, but I imagine that if I did, it would be like picking my favorite child. So it's, it's, this is a tough one. Um, you know, I really, really, because for the first year or so, like Randall and I didn't, didn't interview anybody. It was just, he, mostly because it was like COVID and, uh, you know, we were just, we were just trying to sort of keep our own interest up and keep our own, you know, martial juices flowing. So talking to each other, and that, like he had said before, that's kind of how we got started. And then once we created the podcast and, you know, it was, there was, a, as you, I'm sure, you know, there's all sorts of logistical things you have to figure out, like how to just how to post it and where to, how to edit and all, all of these other pieces. So once we kind of got that ironed out and we were like, you know, six or six episodes in or so, um, then we started talking about doing interviews and the interview piece has been, it's, it's been so good interesting for me just personally just to just to talk to other practitioners and just in a kind of an open format and and randall and i have such different uh i have a lot of different ideas about approach to martial arts and we we've studied deeply different 
martial arts, him with him with his Wing Chun, and you know me with like Xing and Bagua specifically. That I think we bring to the we bring this this a different kind of th- flavor to the table, and you know I think we also started to realize that as we were as we were doing these solo conversations for the first year or so. And then we were like, hey, you know, we, we, we got fairly good at being able to talk to each other because that was kind of an art as well. <laughs> and eventually we were like, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's try some interviews. And so, you know, our, the interview process for us has been, uh, it's definitely, you know, it was another learning curve. Uh, and I think we've been really, really fortunate with the guests that we've had on. Um, and I would say, you know, just personally, like just my, some of my personal favorites and, you know, I'm not blowing smoke here, but like you were for sure what, one of my personal favorites. I got so much mileage out of that, out of that interaction and just talking to you. So um, that would definitely be one. And, and strangely enough, uh, I would also add uh, David Peterson to that. David Peterson's a Wing Chun practitioner. Uh, he's, you know, he's pretty well known um, and and I like, I, I don't do Wing Chun, but like, I've been, I've been with, hanging around with Randall for a long time. So of course I have some familiarity with the art, but to hear a, a really senior practitioner's perspective um, from the outside and then be able to, to watch his interaction or listen to his interaction with Randall. And then to be able to kind of ask kind of the idiot questions, kind of, sort of, um, the, the unknowing questions from the outside, um, was really, really fun. It was, that was such a, I had a really good time with that interview. Um, and of course, of course, Scott and Ryan, um, and Dr. Mark Ching, I had a really good time with, um, Douglas Wong. Um, yeah, we struggled with the, we struggled with his audio on the other end, but, but that was, a, that was a lot of fun too. I could keep going, but I'll just, I'll stop. Without naming any names, have you guys ever had any train wrecks? No, none. Oh, that's great. Not at all. Not at all. As a matter of fact, I was going to add a couple more in. Um, you know, we we got to talk to <laughs> Neil Ripsky, who's been on. Oh yeah, show. cool. Yeah. And and I think and actually even uh, Jonathan Blustein. And I think one of the things that I really enjoyed is those guys train a lot of martial arts, a lot of them. And it's like, okay, how do you manage? your own practice with training all these arts and Jonathan came up with some great answers. And, um, but you know, uh, you know, Neil really took the ball and ran with that. He's like, yeah, he was great. He's like, you know what? You know, I don't like monkey. I'm getting older. That sucks. I have myself videotaped. And when a student wants to learn monkey, I'll go through it with them. He's like, but on my own practice, I don't do that. And it was really refreshing. There's, there's been, one of the joys of this podcast is we we don't affiliate with anybody. We just want to present a platform where people feel safe to say mm-hmm. what they want to say. You know, we're not going to start rivalries. We don't want garbage spit out. But we also want people to be honest. And Neil was really honest. He's like, this is what I practice every day. And then, you know, I might do a month of Bagua. I might do a month of Taiji. I might do a month of the Drunken. I might do you know, half a year of this, a few, you know, a week of that. But he's like, but I practice this every day. So this is my core. And then I work outwards and make sure that I'm, you know, proficient in all these other things that I do. So being able to talk to someone like that, that has, you know, 10 or 15 different systems, it seems like, and, and hearing him say, this is how I train. This is what I do. And this is how I stay proficient. And that's kind of something that has been a joy for at least at least me, and I know oh, Owen yeah. has men- mentioned it too, is we try to bring on teachers that have a method or a system to teach their styles or method or whatever you want to call it. Um, because I, I really believe that a lot of these high-level practitioners – are not only high level practitioners, but they're high level educators too. And, and sometimes those things don't always marry together. You might have somebody that could knock a building over, you know, by looking at it, you know, with their, with their mass magical, mystical powers, but they have no students and they can't teach anybody. Or if they do have students, they're awful. And so, you know, we, we, we try to interview people that have students that are proficient as well. So 
I don't know. Yeah, fantastic. Well, and it's good to hear that there were no train wrecks. It means, you know what I think is happening here, guys? Maybe it's just me and maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like people are better socialized than they were in the 80s and 90s. Mm. Yeah. Since, since now we all have to worry about being on podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, maybe that maybe that has to do with the saturation of information that the internet a age has brought. You know, Owen doesn't have to wait two months for somebody to mail him VHS tapes in the mail. You know, um, I don't have to wait five months for my parents to drive down the 90 miles down the mountain from our small town Granby in the mountains so I can pick up an episode of Black Belt an episode of Inside Kung Fu and the Tai Chi Chi Gong magazine. And then I won't get another one for three or four months. So it's all at our fingertips now. And it's a two edged sword. There's a lot of garbage out there. There's a lot of good stuff out there. And what I'm finding fascinating in this new age, and uh, it's something that I want to bring up with some of uh, guests down the road is how a lot of these teachers, the really good ones, are also utilizing the digital space to teach as well, you know, with their programs. Uh, somebody, somebody that we had on the show that I really enjoyed, and we were actually on his show, and I'm such a fanboy of him. Owen crushed it. Owen crushed it. But I was doing the classic Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights. I'm like, what do I do with my hands? Every time I go back and listen to us on that show, I'm like, God, I was an idiot. But that's our friend uh, Sifu Alex Richter out of New York, the Kung Fu Genius. Yeah, shout and, out to uh, Alex Richter. Shout out to Alex Richter. Yeah, Lived in a castle real. in Germany for three years learning He's Wing great. Chun. And uh, he has a really high level of teaching on the internet as well as in person. And mm -hmm. he stacks his teaching. So it's like, hey, I'm going to teach you on the internet. But if you can make it up to New York, it's, it's transparent, but it's also stackable. So right. I can readjust what I've taught you on the internet in person. It's not like you have to start from square one. And so I, I've been fascinated at Scott Rodell's another one. Yeah. Sifu Scott, Lao Shi Scott, you know, he's got a high level of teaching. Same with Neil. You know, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of these guys that are out there that are doing something that I think is new that we're going to have to talk to in our new little digital space, which is the podcast, is how are teachers keeping these arts and systems alive through the digital media platform? Um, one of the reasons we do our show too, I was talking to Owen about this, is it's kind of cool because we get to talk to the people that we read in those magazines 25 or 30 years ago. And it becomes a digital historical record of their voice and their inflection on how they feel about the material. It's not mm -hmm. just written down. You can hear it in their voice, whether they're a little disappointed, really pissed off, super passionate, super excited. And so I think that that's such a blessing that something like the pl podcast platform can bring to us. And I, I think another big thing, um, not, not to hold the baton too long, but I really wanted to, to talk about this too, is, you know, we get to hear each other as practitioners, but as teachers also. And so I listen to BJJ podcasts. I don't do BJJ, but I know a young man that teaches like a coach. I, I, uh, one of my favorite people out there is Fran Sands and I've actually had him on two Kung Fu podcasts already, believe it or not, even though he doesn't do Kung Fu, he is a Western boxer that teaches youth, troubled youth in UK. But if you watch his videos, Robbie, they're so stacked and they're so detailed that you were, you would think that you were listening to an internal martial artist talk about body structure, footwork, mechanics, how it connects through the legs to the torso, um, through the spine to the shoulders. I'm like, man, that sounds like a good Tai Chi class. So I get to hear other coaches and other people out there and how they problem solve. And I think, how cool is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would, <clears throat> I would add that, you know, for me, it's also, I mean, it's also fascinating from the, the practitioner side to uh, like, I've taught for a number of years and I've also been a student for since forever. And to listen to uh, one of the questions I always like to ask is, okay, well, what was a, what was sort of a, a, a typical 
training session? You know, like when you went to your, you went to go study with your Sifu, what, what did it look like? Just what was it like? And this goes back to that sort of that idea that it's, this is almost, it's like a, it, it, it's a little bit of a document. It's, a, you know, said in the person's own words and with their own inflection and ideas uh, about their training and about how they were trained and whether, and then how they have progressed with that training in their own yes. lives. As a, as a practitioner, you know, and, and then, and then like Randall was saying, we sort of, tr you can sort of transliterate that if they've been teaching a long time um, and kind of how they've been effective as a teacher. And I think that those are, to me, those are just, they're really important, but in, in a greater sort of a meta sense, I think to me that they're, they're important in the, in the way that we're like, cause you know, Chinese martial arts is not in a, in a great state these days. I think that there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of practitioners who, you know, aren't trained very well, but I think there's even more teachers who aren't, aren't trained very well and haven't done a lot of time, um, and haven't had a lot of access to information. So, you know, if, if I can sit down and I can listen to a podcast or I can listen to something and I can, I can have that sort of like moment where I'm like, Oh, Oh, that's, that's a really interesting idea in terms of the, you know, the teaching method. Uh, the, the learning method as a student, like how can, how can I help students get better? Um, you know, I, I think that, that for me, that's sort of one of those like overarching goals, of the podcast. Well, it's really interesting though, that you, you mentioned that because one of the things that, that I see a lot, I'm sort of chronically online as, as the young kid, as the young people say. And, um, one of the things that I've noticed is that like, if you go through one of the short video feeds on like Facebook or YouTube or whatever, you come across all this Kung Fu for some reason, there's so much Kung Fu in short mm -hmm. video clips. And it's stuff like a guy doing, you know, a certain kind of kick or something like that. And if you do this a hundred times a day, you will lose the belly fat. Yeah. And it's like, bro, like, listen, yeah. I've been doing much more than that a hundred times a day and that belly fat it just it's very very difficult to lose so what i what i was kind of trying to get at there is like you were saying that you know the quality uh issue in kung fu is all over the place it's crazy there's some people who are so good and they just make you cry when you see them not just because they hurt your bones but also because they're just so good at what they do and there's other people where you see them and, and you scratch your head and you're like what is this person doing? They must be crazy and delusional. And I think that's a really interesting topic. And I want to hear your, your opinions about what, where, what's going on with Kung Fu. Cause you're the ones who have the Kung Fu conversations, right? So I, I want to, I want to hear about the, your, your takes on this and hot takes are, are welcome, by the way, you don't have to be too politically sensitive. <laughs> so, I'll, 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 Just I don't, don't get start. anybody sued, okay? That's Let all. me tell you about, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to call out specific names. You know, I'll, I'll start with this baton. Um, you know, in college, I fell in love with, wing, you know, Wing Chun. I did the Pak Mei, and I was actually doing some other stuff too in college, but nothing that really stuck. But that was also the age and the burgeoning point of the forums. And I was on the forums for about two years. And I'm like, this is nothing but a platform for people to throw crap at each other. That's all it is. And so I started noticing, even at the early age of like 19, 20, and 21, that there were some things that were consistent in martial arts and the Chinese methods and some things that were inconsistent. And for two guys that grew up in Hick Mountain Towns that started to notice a shift in the landscape, that's got to say something. Because we are not full-time teachers. We have nine to fives. And so for us to start to realize something in our early days of practicing has to be something. And I'll give you some examples. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sorry if I hurt feelings, but a lot of what's being practiced at the mountains, as far as um, Shaolin and Wudan and a few other you know villages, a lot of that is backed by the Chinese government. And I believe that a lot of it is more performance-based than maybe religious-based. And then I believe a lot of it is more performance-based than maybe medicinal-based, like for, to practice Chinese medicine. And I believe a lot of it is more performance-based than actually self-defense-based. 
And I also believe, and here's the kicker. This is the hard one for me because this goes down your avenue a little bit more, Robbie. I believe a lot of it is more performance-based than self-cultivation-based. And that's a that's where a lot of these supposed meccas um, were supposed to be, you know. And it it, it kind of bums me out, you know. I um I I got to listen to um uh, a gentleman that we've had on the show that I really enjoyed talking to, which was William Wayne Williams, who has the Monkey Steals Peach uh, page, and what he oh, you he's know cool. he's yeah mm-hmm. you know what was really cool is you know he uh, did tons of Wing Chun. That was his origin art. And he actually did, you know, Yip Man lineage, Don Yip Man lineage, you know, all the other stuff. And he went over for a year to China and trained in one of the academies. And he has two great videos on that. He's like, here's what I got. Here's what I loved. Here's what I didn't get. What he loved was it was daily training. He's like, I had great training. He also loved this too. Cause, uh, I, I think Will looks like an adult now, but Will's like, oh, I miss my skinny self. I'm like, no, you, you're a full grown man now, Will. You, you, you look you look like a human being now instead of a, a you know a little little bitty bean stick. But he's like, I was in the best shape of my life. We trained so much, we trained so hard. He's like, my forms were beautiful. And then we learned how to do sanda for the fighting, for the bridge. And it's like, well, why not just do sanda? You know, so that's one of the big questions that we ask a lot on our show. It's like, okay, well, if I'm learning the Taoist five elements form at this mountain, why is all of our martial practice Sanda? Why is it not some two man practice? Why is it not entry drills? Why is it not based upon? So those are the kind of questions that we ask ourselves, you know, and and Will was kind enough to go over and learn that the hard way, you know, and then eventually he would go on and find his Tai Chi Mantis, um, which he he loves and practices now. But that's something that I had kind of deduced on my own 20 years previous without having to spend the money for it. That maybe if if I'm looking, because, you know, I started in something that was martial. You know, it, you know Wing Chun is, 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 you know, it's very, okay, let's get to throwing fists and face, you know. And then Owen's very good about doing live sparring, and other things with the Xing Yi. So I was used to Chinese martial arts being martial and being practical. You know, one, one of the great things with training with Owen was, especially with the Xing Yi and the Bagua, is I found it, it's a way to repair my body after a 10 and a half or 11 hour shift of sitting in heavy traffic in a bus all day. So there's that restorative method and re- self-cultivation practice too. And I'm finding that a lot of people that do these temple based arts have none of it and they don't have a good method of practicing as well and so you know that's something that at least i've noticed in that that field of chinese kung fu is what is chinese kung fu you know it it's so hard it it falls so many styles so many brackets you know and and at that point when there's that much out there then you have to i really believe Look at the students and the teachers and how well is their dynamic and how well is their, you know, relationship between each other. At least that's what I, I kind of believe. I don't know for what it's worth. How about you, Owen? I, we're, I'm just, you know, um, just, just, you know what? No, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say something really stupid and get myself in trouble. So just, just go <laughs> take it away, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> well, save that. You say Don't stuff is stupid. Yeah, yeah okay. Exactly. It was about um, bacon grease. <laughs> we we do we also we use quite a a few food analogies on our uh, podcast, so you probably you probably hear it. Anyway, um, so I, you know, I think for me, this it's 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 a this is a tough question because I think that there's a lot of factors going on um, in terms of you know what. Uh, the current state of Kung Fu is um, uh, for me is sort of inexorably chained to its past. And I think that, you know, Chinese Kung Fu has had a long, long history and a lot of evolution. Um, But as far as like where we're at and, and what I see is that there's been a couple of generations before us 
who were, uh, how do I say it? This sort of secretive, especially in the internal martial arts, like it's, you know, sort of Taiji Shingi Bagua lineages. You, I, I'd hear about a lot of, uh, you know, this is, you know, maybe late 1800s, early 1900s up till, you know, the, even now, actually. A lot of Chinese martial arts, internal martial arts teachers who who really had a lot of skill and who were, say, famous for their skill. And yet they didn't have a lot of students who could reflect that skill. So that generally, when I look at that, I, I break it down and I think, okay, well, it's either it's either one of maybe two or three things. Like either it's one, they didn't actually have the skill. Maybe they had uh, not the actual like sort of internal martial arts skill. Maybe they had a different skill and they just used that that skill in place of their internal martial arts. Meaning kind of like Randall was saying, okay, so I do this style of Taiji but really, like, if I use it, I'm going to use Sanda. So, um, you know, that's always a possibility. And then the other thing is, is maybe they had it, but they were they just didn't teach it, or they didn't want to teach all of it, or they were secretive about it. And and I find that 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 sort of legacy of secrecy tends to start to like winnow away lineages, like mm-hmm. the further they get out sort of from that the epicenter of where they were ever wherever they were created the further they get away sort of the the lesser they tend to become um and that's just sort of an observational thing like talking to a lot of people over over the years and uh you know just looking at the general state of the 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 skills of of practitioners out there now of course there's there there are good practitioners and i think that, that maybe this goes back to what we were talking about earlier with this this uh this change into more of the digital age and being able to uh proliferate like chinese martial arts online now i i always have said on the podcast and i will still i will still say it that i think you have to have a hands-on teacher at some point in your evolution absolutely you have to you have to have somebody who can transmit the skills through touch because it's really in my experience it's a very sort of feeling thing it's like you're 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 learning to use your body to produce certain types of force through feeling and so on and so forth so if if you if you don't have that then you can have all the theory but i i think it was going to be difficult to get to uh, an intermediate or advanced level um i think you can get a lot of the basics and I think that uh, a lot of these sort of hybrid programs, which I see out there these days, uh, where you know a personal study online, and then they get an opportunity to go and study with their teacher at a at a seminar for a week or something like that. I think those are great. Um, I think you can really. I think a, a, a hobbyist practitioner, sort of like myself, so as somebody who actually I have like a you know a nine to five type job, uh, and then I can go you know once a year or twice a year and actually go visit my teacher. I think that that's a great format, especially for sort of modern learners. Um, I know that that in my experience, I, I sort of free internet platform, but if you're talking about the seminar formats more. Um, I got a lot of mileage out of those, but I think it was also because I had a lot of background in the information. Um, I had a lot of background in in the the material that was being taught. Uh, so it was easier for me to, I didn't, I would, didn't have to focus so much on being, uh, on picking up the material. Um, and I could work more on detail. I could work more on nuance. I could work more on theory and I could ask more detailed questions. So I guess to bring it back around, you know, I think that the, the natural tendency in towards, you know, secrecy, uh, between you know masters and students in traditional Chinese martial arts in general, but definitely in in the internal martial arts, uh, has really done a disservice to later generations. I'd like yeah. to jump on that wagon just for a second. Um, something else, and this is maybe more in the Southern arts because I've worked a few different systems in the Southern arts. Is lineage? Lineage mm. does not mean just because I am a student of the student. Or just because I'm a direct student of this great master does not mean that I have their skill. What it means is I might have access to a greater teacher and greater knowledge, but the practitioner 
has to do the work. Yeah. The student has to do the work. If you have a great teacher, bless your heart. And if you have a great teacher, work your butt off. That that That's maybe some of the best advice I can do. Because especially in Wing Chun, especially in the late 90s and the early 2000s, it was all this lineage war stuff, right? It's like, oh, I've got the true system or I've got this or I've got that, blah, blah, blah. It's like, do you do the work? You know, I worked with somebody a year ago and it was, it, I felt like it was 1984. It's like, on this lineage. I'm like, great. Let's see your skill. Oh, well, you're good at the stance. Good for you. That, after six years of supposedly working with their teacher, you know, 10 hours a day and all this other stuff, I'm like, you've got, you, you don't have it. You don't have it. You've got a name that you've worked with, but you do not have the skill. And that's on you because I've worked with your teachers, other students, and they're phenomenal. So tis what it is. But I think lineage sometimes can be uh, a barrier that people need to overcome. They have, you know, just because you have a good lineage mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have the goods. So for what it's worth. Well, you know, there's uh, there's all the, the public stuff in, in internal martial arts are like this too, right? There's all the public stuff that everybody says. And then there's all the stuff that you're not allowed to say in public about lineage. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, but not allowed, we're not, none of us are allowed to talk about it in public. So it's not part of the interview <laughs> today. We'll just throw that one out there for everybody. Okay. So I, I, I get where you're coming from. If I'm going to synopsize a little bit and see if you guys agree with me or not. Of course. So basically um, there's a bunch of things that happen in Chinese martial arts, whether they're internal martial arts or external martial arts. And a lot of them come down to um, the ability to communicate uh, between teacher and student and the ability of the student to pick that up and carry it on. And then a lot of stuff um, within that area that, that is, are things that people would recognize, like lineage and you know where the person's pedigree is from, blah, blah, blah. They're, they're definitely important, but there's so many other factors involved. Am I am I sort of am I sort of getting approximately what, yeah. what you guys are saying here? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, good. I I, I like to summarize these things because it, it's also a good test for me to make sure that I'm cognitively still with it. You know, haven't haven't declined too much um, in my semi hermitage uh, state here. Um, but I see people when I go to the coffee shop. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway so so now having having established that um we've talked about um where the show came from who you've had on the show who you really liked um it's all been good so far what's wrong with the chinese martial arts community what's what's good about the chinese martial arts community that's a big question too right so mm -hmm. we wouldn't do this if we didn't really like Chinese martial arts, right? There's no way. Absolutely. And we've all been practicing for a long time. Mm -hmm. So so what what is it? Where's the magic? Why do you guys have a freaking podcast about this weird niche subject? <laughs> I truly I truly believe that maybe one of the shining stars in the Chinese martial arts is you always have something to work on. You always have some there is massive variety in your training i mean if i only did wing chun from from the day i die i would have so much material that's thanks to my sifu uh, shout out to sifu mayor uh, but he's shown me how to take this huge rubik's moving rubik's cube that's you know moving this way and that that is wing chun it's like can you focus on that one little bit and then how does that one little bit tie into a drill? How does that one little bit tie into maybe it's part of the knife form? How does that one little bit cross-reference into chi cell? How does that one little bit that you might see at a downward angle in the form actually change when it comes to the third form? In the first form, it might be here in the third form. Just by changing the planes. Where are the kicks hidden in the first two forms? Well, especially in the first form, you know, all these little problem solving skills, you know, my Wing Chun teacher has a PhD in educational psychology and cognitive development. And so I was taught Wing Chun, not just as an effective Chinese martial arts, 
but a problem solving and learning tool. And Chinese martial arts have that ability, right? I think that's maybe one reason, you know, not the only reason, but maybe one reason that a lot of philosophy, you know, later on was tied into the internal arts, you know, where it has that problem solving quality. But I think that one thing that keeps me interested in the Chinese martial arts is that grain, that sand grain of getting better. There's always, you know, it won't be a giant leap. Once you hit a plateau, there might be little sand grains that you stack as far as getting better. But those sand grains of getting better and being able to get better, God willing, to the day you die, how many martial arts can say that? I, I don't I don't I don't see a lot of 90-year-old Western boxers. I mean, I, I know they're out there. There's probably a few that do five minutes a day on the heavy bag. But you ever hear about how Jack Dempsey knocked out a couple of robbers when he was like in his late seventies? Yeah, I sure did. As a matter of fact, I'm a big fan of Dempsey because he's a Colorado kid. You know, he grew up in Manassas, Colorado. So I, I definitely keep tabs on Well, uh, do you guys on... remember do do you remember that in the in the early two thousands on the message boards would which shall not be named? Actually, it was Ram's Oak Fist. But there used to be this <laughs> giant conversation about how Jack Dempsey's his his drop punch was actually Bung Chuan. From, Bung Chuan, from yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, it's good body mechanics, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's a page in there where Dempsey talks about if you hit correctly, that you're hitting from the bottom of your feet to the tips of your hair and everything in between. And so, you know, it's cool because... On the external level, maybe, and I try not to use the term internal and external too much, but on the external level, you know, there's a dynamic there and court and that that high level of body coordination, you know, of somebody in the West doing Western boxing that has similar mechanics to something in the East. That's another thing, too, is I'm finding also that, you know, there's a bridge between the East and the West now. Maybe on the West, it's Western side, it's the digital um, platform and maybe it's you know breakthroughs and understanding the body uh owen and i are big fans of dr thomas myers mm -hmm. and his work you know with anatomy trains and how he's mapped out the fascial system you know if it's early if it's late 90s early 2000s you know in the world of chinese internal martial arts the only words that you would hear is oh it's the fascia it's the fascia it's the fascia it's the fascia and then you know you realize, well, it's got to be a whole body that does this. It's got to be everything, you know? So how is that all connected? Um, but I don't know. For me, Robbie, I, it, what keeps me going? What do I think is beautiful about the Chinese martial arts is there's, if you've got the right teacher or you've got the right method or system, there is always a way to get better at the process. And if you're a person that loves the process and maybe not the end goal, then you're going to have a full, rewarding, enjoyable life ahead of you with your practice. Nice. How about you, Owen? I was like, "Wow, how am I going to, how am I going to follow how that? How are you going to answer like, now, huh?" <laughs> the, the, the I got up really early. Fun. I, I got up like, early and trained. Yeah, no doubt, I had right? my coffee. <laughs> I was like, right. God, "Geez, that was almost poetic there at the those, end." Those espressos <laughs> are doing magic for you, buddy. Send <laughs> exactly. me your, your your coffee dealer. I heard that you guys have good coffee out west. <laughs> we do. I'll send you a bag. <laughs> um. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question, and I think that uh, for me, it's really changed over time. So like I'm coming up on, on 30 years uh, doing Chinese martial arts and really, you know, very consecutively training. Like I, I don't, I don't miss a lot of days, you know, and I, I uh, <clears throat> um, but I think that, uh, you know, initially it was, it was certainly like, you know, I wanted to learn how to like punch and kick and like fight. And, you know, when I was in my twenties, but as I've gotten older, I, my emphasis has definitely shifted towards more like health and longevity practices. So um, uh, revisiting, and this is, and kind of like Randall was saying, I think that the Chinese martial arts are so broad and sort of diverse, especially when you get into a good system. Um, they're very uh, giving in terms of practices uh, and and to go back and, and revisit certain practices in, in a way, and with a different eye or with a different intention. 
uh, I think really uh, can create a, a dynamic, and at least in my practice, that has helped me stay interested. So, you know, I can take a piece that I've been practicing for 20 years and then and kind of back off of it and and look at it in a different way and like, oh, well, okay, well, what if I applied uh, this concept to this piece and it, and it sort of becomes, it's the same piece, but practiced in a very different way and therefore giving me a very different result. And that that's, that's sort of the, the evolution of it that I have found just fascinating. Um, and, you know, like most, most crazy Chinese practitioners, I, I, you know, I watch a lot of videos online. I watch a lot. I talk to, obviously through the podcast, I talk to a lot of other practitioners. I'm always interested in, you know, what they're doing, kind of how, how the things that motivate them. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that, that for me, it's, it's that, you know, just a sort of, uh, unfolding of the systems that I've been a part of over the years and, and how they evolve as a, as a martial practice, of course, but also as a, as a personal practice, as a, as a health practice. That's awesome. So now you guys are on a bunch of platforms, your podcasts on a bunch of platforms. And, and so can you, can you tell me which platforms you are on? So the good sure. people can find you. Mm-hmm. Sure. You can, you can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Applecast, anywhere you find a podcast. And what we'll do is we usually release like the Spotify and the Applecast and, and, and those other podcasts. We'll release that first. Either it's an episode of Owen and I discussing, and that's the other thing too that we do on our podcast. You'll always find a 20 or 30 minute episode of Owen and I just talking Kung Fu banter between us like coaches and teachers. And then we'll also have our interviews. If it's a longer interview like yours, we will break it up into two pieces. And we do that every Friday. And then also after we drop the Spotify slash Applecast episode, then we will uh, drop what I like to call the glamour shots episode on YouTube because Owen will take all your pictures and it'll make you look good with that little background. So then the following couple of weeks, we release the glamour shots on YouTube. And then we also are on Instagram, which I run that page. You can reach out mm-hmm. and say hello to us there. I'm starting to do some actual podcasting through Instagram. So you might, you might have to check those out. I've done one already with the gentleman that's created the Wave Chi Indian Clubs. Uh, they're little Indian clubs that you swing, super good for your back, your spine, your posture, and they're made here in America out of hemp plastic. So, so that's our my first podcast that I've done on Instagram. And then I'm going to try to do some also on YouTube uh, in, in the next few months. But you can find us there. You can find us on Facebook under Kung Fu Conversations as well. And we're, we're over there. So do, doing our stuff. So pretty much anywhere uh, we're up to some good and no good at the same time. <laughs> so I was keeping a running tab in my mind, just waiting to see, cause I know you guys are West coast guys. So I was just waiting to see when hemp would be brought up. Oh <laughs> yeah. Well, you had to be brought up at some time. You know, hey, you know, actually yeah. we're, we're in the mountains. So we're on mountain time. We're the weirdos right in the middle. Right in the middle. Yeah, yeah, right in the middle. Right in the middle. So there there we go. It's convenient for me because it's exactly a two hour time difference. Oh nice. Hey Robbie, I know we're about to wrap it up, but before we go, and I I don't want to interject this, I don't want to get on a soapbox too much, but you know, bring it on, cause trouble, start a fight. We just had that beautiful (laughs) talk on what's great about what's great about Chinese martial arts. But I I keep I keep forgetting one last thing, not to get too uh too dark yeah i don't want to leave on a dark note but i think there's a lot of people that that practice a lot of forms but have no bridge to tactic body method concept on how to apply and i i guess i kind of brought that up with will and his his journey you know and he's finally in a good place now with his practice but i think that's something else that's been lost maybe in the last you know 50 to 100 years is why are we doing these forms what how are how are they used what are the concepts inside of it? And so, you know, that's something that we address quite a bit on our show. You know, Owen talked about this too. You know, we want a place where if you are a nine to five guy like us and you do teach a martial arts class, you might be in a small rural area and you've got no one to bounce ideas off of. You've got no one to be like, oh God, I, I don't know how to deal with this or I don't know what to do here. 
And so when we do our kind of coach's corner, if you will, of the podcast, it's not only about what we're working on and how we're trying to get better. And in a weird way, it's a digital journal because I might listen to something five years from now and be like, God, I don't do it that way. I don't do it that way. So we can actually see where we've moved and progressed maybe in our teaching method and style. But to that person that's all alone, that feels like they don't have somebody where they can bounce ideas off of, take a listen to what Owen and I train and how we teach. Take a listen to some of these other high-level practitioners and maybe utilize some of the teaching or training methods that they're doing to maybe add a little spice to the cooking that is your own practice. There's the food reference. There it was. Brilliant. Good. It's official episode. Reference. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I'm going to break the fourth wall. Is that what you do? Hello, audience. Yeah. I'm Robert. Coons. <laughs> I'm breaking the fourth wall. Um, I just wanted to mention to everybody that uh, you can find Kung Fu Conversations podcast on any of your preferred streaming media, mediums, it is media, any preferred streaming media. And uh, they are doing new stuff all the time. It's very, very interesting and very fun. And uh, you get to, it's it's uh, like a very martially focused, uh, you know, interesting, uh, friendly place where um, they're, they're bringing interesting and cool people on. And uh, uh, we at Dawi, we have a, a strong affinity for them because we're, let's say, tangentially similar. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of similar things. Well, um, you know, we sort of have a niche that's more toward the specifically toward the internal arts and toward, you know, Taoism and these kind of things. But it's it's really interesting for us. We learn a lot from listening to Kung Fu Conversations podcast because. Likewise. Oh, Likewise, thank sir. you. We, we can find out, mm -hmm. you know, what who, who else is in the community that's interesting. Um, what are some of the different opinions from the styles that are outside of our, our milieu? Um, and, uh, and this has been a real pleasure guys. Can you, can you stick around for a sec after I, uh, turn off the record button? Absolutely. Absolutely. But absolutely. Absolutely. Good. So you heard it here first guys, Kung Fu conversation podcast, check it out. Um, and, uh, either me or Bill will see you in the next video. Have a great day.